All right. So uh, tonight we are having our second session of uh, Sinekeya, uh, our semi salon uh, series for this semester. And uh, yeah, we're very happy to have uh, Pauline and Ivan, uh, actually Ivan and Pauline. Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, as you know, the, the, the topic for this uh, session is that of uh, sort of sign continuity. And uh, yeah, so our presentations will go precisely about this. And uh, so as usual, uh, we are recording. I think we are already recording, maybe? Yeah, yeah, Taylor, I okay. and I, I just uh, want okay. to point more. Very good. Uh, so as usual, uh, if you want to, if you don't want to appear uh, uh, in the video, you can just uh, uh, shut your camera off and uh, we'll have, we'll, we'll take questions after each presentation, but you can write them in the chat also. And uh, at the end of each presentation, you can just open your mic and, and ask your question. Uh, yeah, so I think maybe this is all you need to know for now. So uh, yeah, without further ado, I would uh, then give the floor to Ivan, who should be here, and he should also already be a co-host. So I, I am here. Yes. Yes, and I am a co-host. Oh, let me let me try to start the sharing. Yes. Perfect. Uh, can, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so to, to begin with, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the Senior Salon. And uh, I really appreciate being here today. And I, re I really mean this, it's not a figure of speech because unfortunately the world is becoming increasingly separated and even academia is becoming increasingly separated. Uh, so I'm really glad that we still have uh, this continuity and this connection. Um, ironically, my today's talk will be about uh, Sinekia and uh, how uh, uh, how intersubjective uh, Sinekia works and why it is important for our understanding of how uh, semiosis works. And uh, in a way, uh, this idea of Sinekia is uh, an integral part of uh, Percy's models of semiosis. At least this is something I will try uh, to demonstrate. Uh, the phrase that I put in the title of uh, this talk, uh, let me open this next slide uh, to show how the full phrase uh, uh, looks like. Uh, you can see that Peirce is talking about uh, about the fact that uh, if we are taking this uh, synergist perspective seriously, uh, we should uh, never say that I, I am altogether myself and not at all you. Uh, that uh, uh, selfhood is, uh, is always a kind of, uh, uh, not, not an illusion, but there is a limit to selfhood. We, we should consider ourselves uh, in connection with others. And uh, in fact, he's talking about these two aspects of this uh, idea, not speaking about yourself as uh, at all you, at not uh, at all myself, at not at all you. Uh, first aspect of this idea is this, this uh, kind of, uh, I, I can say, like ethical aspect of this uh, synecia. Uh, but uh, this is not what I'm going to focus on. I will focus on the second aspect. Uh, that is this uh, idea that uh, every person in analogous circumstances resembles yourself in that circumstances. And uh, essentially what Peirce speaks here about uh, is, uh, is a window or, or a potential bridge uh, that we can use to uh, connect a person's phaneroscopy with uh, other phenomenological traditions. And I will show how uh, this, uh, this idea of uh, 
being being similar to others in similar circumstances or being connected to others in similar circumstances uh, is essential for connecting uh, Persis phenomenology with social phenomenology. And uh, as a result, uh, it actually brings us closer to Persian social semiotics. Let me switch to the next slide. So, and another, uh, uh, another uh, piece from Peirce that they want to comment on, and actually not, not so much comment on, but start with, uh, is uh, this um, phrase about uh, the connection between thought and action. Uh, and that this is something uh, that we've discussed in the, uh, in the previous seminar salon, and I think it's a nice uh, connection between and a nice uh, continuity between uh, our similar salon sessions. So uh, Peirce is saying that the end of thought is action and the end of action is thought. And uh, there's also this continuity here, the continuity between thought and action. And as I will try to show in my talk, uh, these two ideas actually work together very well. The one about uh, this intersubjective synechia and another one about this continuity between thought and action. And actually, if we infuse uh, our understanding of Peirce's uh, semiotics uh, with, uh, with the deep understanding of these two ideas, this really uh, it brings us uh, forward, or at least uh, uh, it, it really helps me to uh, get a better reconstruction of this uh, Peirce's uh, semiotics and uh, really shows full potential of these ideas. Uh, I, have, I have already started talking about intersubjectivity, but uh, just one essential reference has to be mentioned here. Uh, is a, this is a re reference to uh, Edmund Husserl, who, um, who introduced this idea of we subjectivity, uh, talking about life world, uh, Husserl speaks that uh, Husserl says that the world is uh, given, uh, not always given to I, the man, but to we. Uh, so we, uh, the world is given to us, and the world uh, often appears as something given to us, given to this uh, collective uh, subjectivity or this uh, intersubjective uh, self. And uh, as I said, uh, I, I can see a lot of uh, uh, great and uh, po powerful uh, parallels between Husserl's uh, ideas and uh, Husserl's phenomenology and uh, Peirce's phenomenology. Uh, and the central question that I'm going to focus on today is this question of why this concept of intersubjective synechia that Peirce uh, uh, formulates is important for our understanding of semiosis and social semiosis in, in particular. Uh, so it's just some general plan of, of, of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I will try to start uh, with showing that actually this uh, principle of, of continuity of minds and actually multiplicity of minds is, uh, uh, is an essential part of Peirce's uh, semiotics. And uh, I've also discussed this uh, um, synechia between acting mind and thinking mind. Um, then I will continue showing how these fundamental principles of acting mind and thinking mind, how they work together, can give us models for different kinds of semiosis for, uh, for uh, very basic uh, biosemiotic models, uh, and then to more complex uh, models of uh, preconceived action and social interaction. Uh, even though those are not the same models, and I, I will show how they are distinct, they all can be uh, reconstructed based on these fundamental person uh, ideas. And uh, then I will talk about how intersubjectivity can be uh, deduced from these 
uh, reconstruction of Percy's social semiotics. And then I will show uh, some connection between this uh, possible Percy and social semiotics and other uh, sociological and linguistic, uh, other traditions in social semiotics and social phenomenology and linguistics. So I will, uh, as a starting point, I will take uh, this well known model of sign proposed by Peirce as a, as a, um, as a mediated relation between the time and object via interpreting. Uh, so if we uh, take a look at, at how Peirce discusses this model, uh, we can see that Peirce actually uh, suggests that any sign always suggests some multiplicity of selves or multiplicity of minds, uh, even though they can, they can be quasi minds, like uh, the same mind that still uh, kind of is divided into the utterer and interpreter. Uh, on the one hand, it is divided. On the other hand, uh, those selves or those minds are welded in the sign. So uh, there is, uh, on the one hand, there is, there is this distinction between the quasi utterer and quasi interpreter. On the other hand, there is this connection and continuity between them. Uh, how we can make this idea more uh, more usable and more applicable <clears throat> to in the actual analysis of science? I think that uh, what is uh, what can be quite useful here is Peirce's uh, typology of interpretants, uh, because in his typology of interpretants. Uh, First, actually uh, distinguishes between different uh, effects of sign. And those effects are, either have, have to do with uh, meaning of the sign or the action that is uh, brought about by the sign. Or there is also this final interpretant that is the habit or the general rule uh, that is produced by the sign. So first speaks about three distinct kinds of interpretant. The immediate interpretant, that is the meaning of the sign. The dynamical interpretant, that is the actual event brought about by the sign. And final interpretant, that is the habit produced by the sign. And I will use this, uh, uh, this uh, typology of interpretants uh, to suggest uh, one of possible reconstructions of uh, Peirce's model of uh, semiosis. Uh, so if we try to, uh, to represent how uh, this model of semiosis with three kinds of interpreters uh, works, uh, we can show it as this kind of square uh, where uh, there is this immediate interpretant or initial interpretant, the I with the small i index. Uh, that is the meaning of the sign, the meaning of the representation. Uh, and there is another uh, interpretant that is a very dynamic interpretant that is shown at the, at the I with, uh, with, uh, with D uh, index here. Uh, and uh, in the, uh, what, what I show in the middle here is this final interpretant or the habit uh, that is produced uh, also as an effect of, uh, of uh, of this sign. Peirce actually does not comment, as far as I understand, on uh, exactly what kind of habit he means when he speaks about this final interpretant. And um, what I suggest here is to distinguish actually between two habits produced by the sign, because the one habit is this habit of meaning or habit of producing particular immediate interpreters that is uh, shown as H with M index here. Uh, and there is another kind of habit, the habit of action, uh, that is the habit with A index in this scheme. Uh, we can also discuss, as, discuss it as, a, as one habit, habit of producing uh, particular in, in immediate and dynamic interpreter, but still we can distinguish between two. So uh, why this model 
uh, is important and how it can be used. Uh, let's start with Peirce's own example. So Peirce says that if there is a sign that is, for example, a military command, uh, there is, if we speak about the immediate interpreter, the immediate interpreter is just the meaning of this phrase, the command that is given. This is this kind of mental effect that is produced by the by the sign upon the uh, upon the interpreter uh, interpreter's mind. Uh, but uh, what is considered a dynamic interpreter? The dynamic interpreter uh, in Peirce's example is this action made by this uh, rank of men who hear this command. Uh, another example that can be useful here is uh, a, an example from biosemiotics, the famous tick example uh, from, uh, from Uxku. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot credit uh, the author of this uh, great representation of the tick uh, because I was unable to find it, find who is the author, but I just uh, I couldn't uh, uh, help but uh, using this uh, great representation of T tick uh, jumping uh, when when uh, he smells this uh, butyric acid. So uh, this uh, jump of the tick uh, is. Uh, can be considered a dynamic interpreter, that is the actual effect uh, that is uh, produced by this uh, butyric acid that acts as a representative for the tick. Uh, and the reason why I'm starting with this example from biosemiotics is because I think that the, in this basic form, this model works well for biosemiotic. Uh, functional relations, but it's not uh, detailed enough to account for some more complex uh, uh, semiotic uh, phenomena, social semiotic phenomena. Uh, let, me, uh, let me demonstrate what I mean. Well, uh, here's a little example, a kind of auto-ethnographic example. Um, uh, let's say I, I see a note in my calendar app that I'm having a semi salon presentation today. Um, this is a, this is a, by the way, here we can see this distinction between um, quasi utter and quasi interpreter in myself because this is the note I left, I left for myself. Uh, and so I see this note and um, if, if we consider what is the immediate interpreter of this uh, note, this is obviously this mental effect of the, uh, of, what what is this uh, note means for me? Uh, what is the meaning of, of it? But actually, if we think about what is the dynamical interpreter of this note for for me, uh, we can think that uh, the action, uh, the uh, the actual event that is brought about by this note, is me uh, logging into uh, Zoom today and uh, joining all all of you. So uh, and there is also a habit uh, of me reacting to these kinds of messages in this uh, habitual way. Uh, however, as I said, uh, this model is probably not detailed enough, even though it is, it is rather accurate. Uh, what I'm talking about, let me, let me just show in a second. Uh, what I suggest to consider is that actually, when we're talking about this, uh, uh, this preconceived action, like uh, the action of me uh, clicking the Zoom application, the, it is not exactly the same as the pig just jumping uh, from, the, uh, uh, from, from, from the branch. Uh, because uh, what is going on here is that the dynamical interpreter itself uh, is a meaningful uh, action. So the the act of the act that is brought about by by sign is itself sign. So we can kind of uh, distinguish uh, the same uh, elements like the the immediate interpreter and the dynamic interpreter inside this 
uh, this sign that is the reaction to other sign. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, what can be helpful here is that we can use actually some categories from uh, social phenomenology uh, to kind of uh, clarify this scheme a little bit. Uh, what I suggest is to refer to after Schutz's uh, term action that he uses to refer to uh, to, uh, to conduct that is based on preconceived project. So then we have this distinction between action and act. So the action is this um, conduct devised in advance, in advance and uh, it is based on preconceived project. And the act is just the uh, outcome, the, the, accomplished, the accomplished action itself. So uh, here we can kind of map these uh, Schutz's uh, terms on, uh, on this person uh, model. And we can uh, really see that uh, we can distinguish between the, uh, this act of clicking on uh, Zoom app is actually uh, based on some project, some, uh, uh, some preconceived uh, idealization uh, of uh, why I do this. Uh, and uh, the click itself can be considered an act. So uh, this way we can really uh, untangle this uh, uh, dynamical interpretant of this first act of semiosis into a separate act of semiosis uh, itself. Uh, and we can call this second uh, level, the level of, uh, of action. Uh, what is also uh, uh, helpful here is that uh, Schutz is talking about uh, uh, this important role of uh, idealizations uh, that uh, are necessary for, um, uh, for action. And in fact, he almost it's uh, what, uh, what's, what's, what Peirce says about habits. So, uh, actually should says that uh, any projection, any uh, action that is based on projecting, uh, it is based on this uh, idea of typical circumstances, that uh, I in, in typical circumstances will behave in this, would behave in this typical uh, way. And uh, this is very similar to how Peirce speaks about habits and um, uh, saying that habits are uh, or would be uh, behaviors uh, that are associated with particular uh, circumstances. So we can say that we can also map this, uh, should this idea of idealization of this uh, person, uh, semiotic model as an equivalent of final interpreter. Uh, to make things even more interesting, uh, and actually to go to the core of my argument that is about this intersubjective synechia. Uh, we can continue this auto-ethnographic ex uh, example uh, and uh, say that actually the, the dynamical interpretant of the action of me clicking on the Zoom app, app is not just me clicking on the Zoom app, what I do when I click on the Zoom app, app I, is that I am joining the senior solo. And, and, and this is here the actual uh, intersubjective Nikia kicks in. Because if we suggest that uh, we have these uh, two representaments, the one is the, the perceived representament, another representament that is representament of action. Uh, that is, that uh, that are actualized for me, uh, but there is also uh, the, the the same process going on uh, in other people, uh, and this is this is how semi or salon is possible. So so semi or salon is something happening between us, not not uh, not that I uh, this is something uh, I participate in alone. And uh, this is actually why I'm clicking the Zoom app. I'm clicking the Zoom app uh, in order to join the semi salon. So. Um, what is interesting here is that this, um, 
this uh, habit of action that is uh, produced here uh, is actually uh, the habit that connects uh, what is happening to me with what is happening to us. So this, this habit, that is the habit of action on this uh, level of uh, dynamical interpreting uh, of the first sign that is the near, merely this node uh, is actually an intersubjective habit. This is the habit that is uh, that, uh, this is the habit that has to be shared by us in order to, uh, in order for this act of semiosis to work. Uh, and uh, if we, uh, so if we develop this uh, very basic Persian uh, idea of semiosis as a, as a system of representation, object and uh, interpreter, but then we add the distinction of uh, immediate dynamical and final interpreters there. And then we consider that dynamical interpreters can be themselves meaningful actions. Uh, and then we consider that those meaningful actions can involve multiple persons. We come to this, uh, th this model in which uh, there are intersubjective habits that are necessary parts of this uh, so simulus. Uh, once again, there is a lot of uh, similarities in this model with what we find in uh, social phenomenology. Uh, this is something uh, what Schutz discusses when he speaks about the uh, reciprocity of uh, perspectives. Uh, this uh, implication that is very similar to the one uh, that Peirce speaks about when he says that uh, all men, for example, you in the in analogous circumstances are in a measure yourself. So uh, this, this assumption or uh, this uh, reciprocity of perspective assumptions or the cynicist assumption in uh, Peirce's terms um, is, is essential for, uh, for any social semiotic uh, model. And as we can see, if we, um, if we connect Peirce's ideas about cynicism with Peirce's ideas about semiosis, we really have uh, all we need for a, a Persian uh, social semiotics. Uh, and actually, if we go back to this Peirce's example with the rank of man uh, reacting to the military command, uh, we can we can see that actually this example of Paris is uh, is also an example about the mean action. It's not a mere mere reaction to the military command because uh, uh, this this is a this is something that uh, uh, that uh, has meaning to those uh, men who performed these actions. Even even, even though I think that uh, Paris uh, has shown this this example of uh, military command just because it's uh, it's kind of uh, more. Uh, uh, this aspect of preconceived action is less manifested in, in military command because it's it's a close to it's more close to uh, some uh, automatic not automatic but this uh, simple fun functional relation that we find in uh, in how ticks uh, work uh, for example. Uh, so a couple of words about how these ideas of uh, intersubjective sneaky appear in other. Traditions. So, uh, even though uh, the Cesur doesn't uh, go into my detail on this, he obviously, at least for me, it is obvious that he uh, uh, he does uh, think about language and, more importantly, uh, about other semiotic systems as uh, about something that is uh, that are intersubjective habits or collective habits. Uh, in particular, the Saussure uh, speaks about uh, language being a collective phenomenon uh, that is uh, perceived by uh, collective consciousness. Uh, when when you know, Saussure speaks about uh, synchronic linguistics, this is how he describes uh, language. And uh, in other uh, writing, in, in other pieces from uh, the course of general linguistics, uh, we can also find Peirce speaking about uh, other semiotic systems uh, saying that other 
uh, semiotic systems uh, or means of expression in those semiotic system systems uh, rest uh, upon the same principle of collective habit. So uh, this principle of uh, intersubjective synechia is not only something we can find if we really dig into uh, uh, into Peirce uh, or, or if we uh, we read uh, phenomenological, uh, social phenomenological um, uh, authors. We can find it in other semiotic traditions as well. Uh, we can also find uh, some attempts to speak about intersubjective habits in the existing social semiotic traditions, like the social semiotics that is written with these capital letters, social semiotics that, that is coming from a uh, systemic functionalist tradition that was uh, proposed by uh, Bob Hodge and Gunter Kress. And uh, if we take a look at, at how uh, Hodge and Kress are talking about uh, logonomic systems, um, we can see that they actually, uh, th this term can actually be interpreted as an attempt to speak about those uh, intersubjective habits, those uh, rules that work in the collective consciousness. Even though what Hodge and Tress add there is a kind of more uh, agonistic perspective, and uh, this is very helpful as well because uh, we can really see that, uh, we can really take into account that uh, even though logonomic systems uh, do function uh, intersubjectively, this doesn't mean that all the um, all the subjects involved uh, necessarily win from this or uh, agree or happy with uh, following these uh, logonomic rules, but but still those rules uh, exist as uh, intersubjective habits. So to sum up some of the key points uh, of my talk. Uh, what, I tried, what I've tried to show today is that it can be productive to uh, consider not to separate person's ideas about uh, cynic ears, like uh, this, um, I don't know, transpersonal uh, uh, kind of uh, insight, uh, some, some spiritual insight of course, but to consider his cynicist uh, ideas uh, very practically and apply them to uh, consider them as an integral part of person's semiotics is something that is that is helpful and productive. Uh, and uh, this idea of separated but but welded minds is in fact something that Peirce explicitly talks about when he introduces uh, his semiotic theory. Uh, and uh, there is this idea of synechia between thought and action that as I, as, as I tried to show today is also uh, very important. If we, and if we consider this connection between meaning and action, between meaning and action and really try to, uh, uh, try to put them both uh, into our models of semiosis, and uh, they can uh, they can be more uh, more adequate for uh, some uh, forms of semiosis, especially for uh, complex uh, forms of semiosis like social semiosis. Uh, and probably the last uh, the maybe not the last but almost the last thought I want to uh, reiterate here is that. Uh, if we uh, infuse first these more complex re reconstructions based on Peirce's fundamental ideas of semiotics that are more applicable to social semiotics, we see that, uh, there, that there is a place for uh, intersubjective synechia in those models. Uh, even we can say that uh, those models suggest that uh, intersubjective synechia is necessary for uh, social semiosis. Uh, and uh, if we uh, add these ideas, if we uh, consider Peirce's semiotics uh, through the lens of Peirce's synechism, that actually helps us to bridge uh, Peirce's semiotics with other uh, semiotic traditions, with other sociological traditions, um, and 
with other linguistic traditions, uh, because in uh, many of those theories, there is some uh, some for some discussion of intersubjective phenomena and intersubjective continuity. And uh, this very general principle of cynicism that is proposed by Peirce can actually work as a good kind of umbrella uh, term or a generalization for all those uh, particular accounts uh, of uh, intersubjective continuity that we find in uh, in Saussure's in linguistics and in social semiotics and in uh, social phenomenology and so on. Uh, that's all what I wanted to say today, and I will really appreciate your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you a lot for this uh, wonderful and very, yeah, very nice presentation. And uh, we already have a question. So, Oscar. Uh, Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Ivan, for such an interesting, uh, very well explained uh, presentation. I think you did a great work uh, communicating Peirce uh, in a very direct way. So my uh, question would be, I'm interested in knowing your opinion about uh, if it's possible and even necessary to apply socio-semiotic approach to biosemiotics. To understand, to understand living systems as social systems, taking into account this uh, cynicism from Peirce. And uh, yeah, what can you share about that? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, uh, I want to have our models of semiosis continuous, but not collapse all into one moment. So I, I really want to reserve this category of social for more complex social things like what uh, what should suggest like a pre preconceived action that is based on a project that is based on some idealization and so on. Uh, and this is what I want to reserve for social. Even though there are alternative ways to use the category of social uh, and I, uh, it, it, they, does, they do make sense. For example, if we go, uh, once we had this discussion with Bob Hodge, on what is, what is social semiotics. And Bob just says that uh, if we have just two entities that interact and exchange something, this is social. Well, I would say that both approaches are possible. Uh, I just think that if we uh, reduce socialness to just multiplicity of agents, uh, this actually, the category, maybe the category of socialness is more rich and we can, can use it in a more nuanced way if we reserve it for a more complex form of semiosis, like we can see uh, interaction of uh, complex, uh, complex uh, agents. Uh, so uh, once again, I think that uh, it is good to consider this, uh, this chain of, uh, uh, of uh, more and more complex semiotic uh, systems, uh, but but it's productive to keep them distinct. Like the bi biosemiotic systems and social semiotic systems are not are based on the same principle, but they are not identical. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, just one last comment. Maybe we can chat later on that. I'm really interested in follow in uh, following this train of thought that you just started. Uh, so my comment would be. If we humans are, uh, yeah, belong to the animal kingdom, uh, and we are social animals, and we have, we are therefore an animal society. <laughs> uh, does that mean that the only complex agents that you mentioned that can be studied socially are human animals? And if not, well, what are the implications for that? But we can uh, speak about it later. Yeah, so maybe... I, I, I will give a, give a short answer. When I speak about think about biosemiotics, I usually speak about the most radical forms, like the like uh, I don't know bacteria and so on. Obviously, we can find some elements of socialness in in the sense that I use it in like uh, other apes and so on. So I, I do not reserve socialness for humans only. I'm just saying that not all biosemiotics be considered as social semiotics. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
wait, wait. I have the advantage because I'm here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let, 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 take, let me take Professor Mihail's question and then I will go back to you. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to thank Vanya for uh, giving this uh, uh, very enlightening uh, interpretation of different interpretants, uh, three interpretants, uh, and I find it it's very enlightening, as well as parallels with shoots uh, in this regard. But my, my question is a different one. Uh, it's uh, related to. Uh, uh, it's not related directly to your to your uh, presentation, but rather to the whole idea of uh, uh, Synechia. Uh, uh, well, why uh, on earth uh, Peirce uh, decided to use this uh, notion? Because uh, strictly speaking, uh, it is a reproduction of the same cognitive uh, uh, scheme uh, as communication. Uh, it's uh, co-holding, co-grasping, uh, one in uh, Latin, another in, in Greek. Uh, uh, well, th that, that was really amazing me all the time. I, 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 I don't have an answer, probably you can have. It, it's, it's the same way as, as, as I'm amazed by the coexistence of, of two notions, uh, metaphor and transfer. Uh, also exactly the same uh, uh, cognitive uh, schemes, and they coexist. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I think that's uh, there's something behind it, uh, in my understanding, but I can't understand what probably you can uh, yeah, somehow comment on that. Thank well, I, I think I think we can invent a productive way to use uh, to have both communication and snake here. Uh, well, I guess that. Uh, why, how, how is communication, how can we think about communication without synecia? Well, we can think about some basic, uh, some basic uh, kind of indexical information or interaction between, uh, between objects uh, that uh, inform each other, but do, do not have to share any uh, common perspective. They, they, don't have this reciprocity of perspectives to use once again uh, this Schutz's term. So we, so I would say that communication without synecia is possible. But uh, but if we think about communication in more kind of social semiotic perspective, then obviously all the all the social communication is a synechistic communication. That's why um, that's why uh, it is difficult to think about communication without synecia. But yeah, we, 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 I think we can find uh, communication without sneaky. And at least without, without this intersubjective sneaky. Maybe there is some sneaky in terms of like just continuity of, of being. Uh, well, that, then, yeah, sneaky is everywhere. Okay, so let us take. Oh. Uh, probably probably uh, just uh, one uh, guess uh, double uh, communication or doubling communication somehow. What, what do you think? But uh, anyway, that, that was my guess, but I'm not sure. Okay, so now let us take Anna's question, please, please. If you can come here. Uh, hey, what a nice presentation. Uh, I want to ask, like uh, when you mentioned the notions of interpretants, like uh, the uh, the immediate, the dynamic, and the final. So I want to know if um, those three components are all embodied in the like main interpretant, which creates semiosis, or they can be separated, which can create like let's say um, some sort of types of semiosis, like different categories of semiosis. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what what's Peirce's uh, idea here because Peirce doesn't actually discuss in that much detail, uh, especially if the final interpreter is like very very uh, unclear what he means because in different instances he means different things. Uh, the way I see it is maybe like the stages of the same process. So uh, for uh, we, ha we have to have immediate interpreter to have a dynamical interpreter. And we have to have a, an immediate interpretant and a dynamic interpretant to have the habit that would be a final interpretant. So I would say it's not only the kinds of interpretants, but also the phases of interpretation. Mm -hmm. 
And what about emotional interpreting? Where do you fit that? Emotional interpreting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, from, from what I understand, birds played with different uh, ways to systematize interpretings. And uh, I just, I, I'm unable to map uh, this one uh, systematics on another. So uh, not, I, I'm not saying that this is impossible, but I, but I felt it. <laughs> yes. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, very good. So do we have uh, any more questions? Uh, what about the Olomouc group? Uh, I, I, I think there should be some, uh, okay, or maybe not. <laughs> Uh, fabulous, fabulous presentation. <laughs> and um, I was just going to point out that when discussing the topic theme for the series about synechia and continuity, I had never even made the connection between versus synechia or synechism and intersubjectivity. But I'm glad that you pointed it out to me because intersubjectivity and uh, distributed subjectivity, I guess, for semiotics has been an important theme for me. So I appreciate your pointing that out and thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, and, and uh, so now Josh, please. Uh, yeah, that was great. I, I really appreciated the, the, the very thoughtful diagrams. Um, it's, it, that takes a lot of work actually. To, <laughs> I, I completely sympathize. Um, but on that note, I mean, I'm a huge fan of diagrams myself, but I'll sort of cha channel Kalevi Cool, maybe perhaps, um, and 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 bring up the caveat slash you know warning question uh, about irreducibility. Um, you know, there's a couple of the former questions are about you know can we se separate uh, you know just you know, there's always this tension between distinctness and discreteness, right? Mutual exclus exclusivity is, is, is always sort of haunts per interpreting purse. You know, can the object be fundamentally separate from, uh, you know, its interpretant and its uh, representation? And I think we all agree that they can't. But what's interesting is that you've it further individuated really nicely some of these things. So then it begs further questions like, well, could those be you know, uh, mutually exclusive of each other. And I just want, maybe want to suggest slash ask, like, um, well, the suggestion, the claim is that none of these, in order to be synechistic, um, none of these things can be reducible. None of them, in other words, um, they can't be reduced. They can't, um, well, let me put it a different way. Um, that they're not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, and, and, and one final sort of interpretation, I was just reading uh, Kalevi Kuhl and partners, oh shoot, uh, with, uh, hold on, this is a great paper, um, the semiotic threshold with um, Claudio Higuera, forgive me, um, really great paper, you know, trying to understand the semiotic threshold, like when is a sign a sign? Um, and I think that really gets to the heart of what it is your talk is also about. And I like Winifred's no Noth's notion of making the distinction between dyadic versus um, he, he feels that the semiotic threshold is is the is the is the when we get to the triadic and and we we really embrace it. Um, some people would disagree. Like communication theory, right, is dyadic, but or a Saucerian approach might be dyadic, but that, that there's that. I think I totally agree with you, and this would be my final thought, is, is that I like how you focused on reciprocity of perspective. I'd like to suggest that that's, that's really fundamental. In other, in other words, that um, Peirce's uh, agapism, you know, the sympathies, that there's shared sympathies, that there's overlapping sympathies, and that that's a precondition for semiosis, and then that entails the third, you know, the 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 triadicity um, that's that's irreducible to in, um, to entail the uh, cynicism anyway <laughs> sorry that was a lot but uh, what what are your thoughts on that oh, yeah a lot of insightful comments well um, uh, I guess um, what I tried to show is a simplification 
And what they try to show there is maybe that there is not one semiotic chess code, but a series of chess code between different kinds of semiosis. But it is obviously a simplification and Schutz's concepts were helpful here because it really kind of shows this, uh, what is the meaningful action uh, and uh, we can contrast it to uh, uh, to Uxkul's account of uh, functional circle. So we can, uh, can observe this uh, kind of uh, reference points, but actually I think there is a continuity between those models and it is not always uh, obvious, or for example, where there starts an action that is based on preconceived project, that what is preconceived project anyway, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if, if you try, if you put these questions, uh, it becomes less nice and there, on the one hand, it becomes less nice, but uh, but there, there's emerges this continuity of different sides and different uh, forms of semiosis. So they are, they are different, there are di different, more or less complex uh, semiotic forms, but, there, but, but probably there are no kind of strict chess holes within them. It's more, there is, there is some continuity within them. But what I, what I tried to show that we can notice the differences if we try to. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, th thank you. And uh, we have one, maybe one last question uh, in the chat. And I will uh, read it. Uh, this is from Miriam Holiska. I, I hope that's pronounced right. So the question is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how would you say these concepts could be used to examine the so sociological aspects of gender expression, the concept of femininity, masculinity, etc., and the adherence to them in social contexts? Uh, thank you, and uh, great presentation. And uh, well, then she's uh, apologizing because her uh, microphone is broken. So that's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate this question about the sociological aspects uh, in general, because, because uh, I myself, am, I'm coming from political science. So, so for me, I always look at semiotics as a, an instrument of sociological research. So and what I try to do to show here is that we can have both fundamental semiotics and social semiotics, and we have some continuity between them. And obviously this can be helpful for the sociology of gender expression. Um, uh, well, uh, I think that when we speak about uh, gender expression, we, have, we probably have to, uh, maybe what is fruitful here is look at this logonomic systems category that I think is, is a more uh, kind of adapted to these kinds of questions because uh, gender expression is not that uh, that's that simple. There is some some kind of shared uh, habits about gender expression, but there is at the same time there is some struggle going on, and that's why um, maybe it's a good thing to infuse uh, Perse Perse's uh, uh, Perse's ideas here with some uh, some ideas of this uh, agonistic uh, social semiotics uh, proposed by Kress and Hodge. But, it's, but what I tried to show is that the, there is no kind of barrier between this uh, uh, Marxist uh, systemic functionalist social semiotics and personal semiotics that they really have a lot of things in common. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is just very uh, great, great session. And uh, so one, uh, I think this will really be our last uh, question from Armando. Uh, you can uh, keep it short. Uh, listen to me guys yeah 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 we can listen okay uh well have a good day to you all very nice presentation i uh, am interested if uh, i can have any lecture where i can follow up with this uh, subject you are laying on the presentation i think it's very interesting the the uh, peers approach towards uh, this phenomenon and uh, I would also like to have uh, the presentation, if you may send it to me, please. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, this relationship between uh, biosemiotics and the sociological level. Actually, I will be interested in a lecture you can recommend after this presentation uh, from peers because I think that uh, we have a, a lot of uh, um, open field to research in that area. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Armando. So my, uh, my question is about the lectures you will recommend to. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't I, I don't know any open course on semiotics. I think I uh, I have asked Kalani, for example, if they have some uh, uh, online courses on semiotics in Tartu, and uh, they do not have that. We have a series of lectures on biosemiotics by Sergei Chibanov. Uh, in 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 Yon Institute in Russia, but they are in Russian. Uh, and uh, this aspect of course I was talking about today is uh, is not kind of this very basic uh, level of course. So I'm not sure that there are lectures that discuss in detail this uh, this uh, systematics of interpreters and so on. So uh, maybe someone who can say in the ch in, in chat for for know that I, I'm unable to answer that. And what uh, and about the presentation, I will I think we will discuss with uh, with uh, uh, Tyler how we can share it. I will share the slides and uh, he can upload it to Senior Salon website or Facebook page. I think this is possible. Yep. Great. Thank you. And yes, you can always. Uh, send those uh, the things either to Tyler or to me or just to the semi uh email and yeah, we can definitely share them. But uh, well, thank you, Ivan. Thank you once again for this wonderful presentation and thanks everybody for this uh, vivid discussion. And uh, yeah, so Oscar has already been sharing some uh, readings on Perth and uh, well, so now uh, let us